All right. Main focus today is helping everyone feel ready for the test. Uh, after talking about my last section, one, uh, as help and also as a comfort, I put useful information on the board and it'll just live here throughout the entire week. So whenever you take the test, you'll have access to these conversions and such. One less thing for you, well, three, four less things to worry about. I try to write them within the questions, but just in case they're not good to, I mean, we'll just stay there. Um, main focus again is addressing any questions, concerns you guys have about the test or anything else. Um, homework, practice test, um, anything on your minds at all, it's all fair game for lecture this week. It's our entire focus of lecture itself. If you need. So at any point you feel comfortable with the test, then, or if you've already taken it, then you can have the rest of lecture this week off. So. Study sessions, what's on your minds? Yes? Okay, so number Bob on the practice test. I just remembered, actually, there's something I need to mention about that one. I made a mistake. Okay. <laughs> okay. I assume then that's what you were asking about. Uh, trying to get that back on. All right. So, number five practice test. This was an orbit question. And Setup is fine. For an orbit question, you do want to compare gravity to centripetal force. My problem is uh, mass of the Earth starts with a five, and for some reason I wrote six. That six came from nowhere. That six is incorrect. That was a mistake made on me. Uh, so I apologize. That means that the orbital radius would shrink to about 13 million, and the height would shrink to about 6.7 million. That's on me. Please call me out on my mistakes when I make them, because if I don't fix them, that's bad for everyone. Yes? I, I still have a question about this. So, um, I was basically confused because it was like asking for a height. But yes. We're solving for radius, but radius is given. So, I'm confused. So, the radius listed in the question is Earth's physical radius. Just the literal size of a planet. And most things orbiting the Earth orbit at an orbital radius, the R in the formula, uh, much greater than that. So, Earth uh, moon, for example. The moon's orbital radius, so the r in all those formulas up there, is the distance from the core of the moon to the core of the planet. And that's the, the same for any time you use these formulas. For both centripetal force and gravity, the r's present is from core to core, not surface to surface. So, uh, for an orbiting object, be it the moon or be it a meteor much closer to Earth, R is core to core. What this means in relation to Earth's physical radius is that that R is equal to the sum of height above the ground and the Earth's physical radius. Well, it's the same R on both sides. And so what I intended to show here is, since it's the same R, because both formulas ask for distance of core to core, uh, it's the same R on both sides. So if you multiply both sides by R squared, you get R squared divided by R, which just simplifies to R. A similar kind of thing would happen with the other centripetal force formula. that being the angular one with omega. Except this time the R is not in the denominator, so if you bring this R over, you actually end up with R cubed. So, 
once again, uh, I was trying to, trying to list out specific steps to remember about this type of scenario. We have an orbit in space. An in space orbit is caused by gravity acting as a centripetal force. We got to use universal law of gravitation because, you know, m times 9.8 is not true once you leave Earth's surface. The r's in both of these formulas are the same. That is the core to core distance of the orbits themselves. And on planet Earth, that orbital distance would technically be the sum of Earth's physical radius plus your height above the ground. If your orbital radius is smaller than Earth's physical distance, physical radius, uh, that implies you're just gonna hit the Earth. And so NASA's constantly doing calculations like this to see if nearby passing space objects will orbit us or slam into us. Yes. So the final R is the distance from the core of the meteor to the core of Earth, and then you take that and subtract it from the radius of Earth divided the distance from the core of the meteor to the surface of Earth. Correct. Yes, you're absolutely right. Now, it's going to be core of meteor to surface of Earth, but if the core of the meteor is, you know. Most meteoroids aren't like moon size. Their radii is kind of negligible on the cosmic scale. And again, I mistake made on my part if you're looking at the answer key. This is supposed to be mass of the Earth. I wrote a six instead of a five, and that has made both of this and the height bigger than they were supposed to be. So that's my mistake. Um, and again, this R is the core to core distance. This is what I would call orbital radius. So if all I ask for is orbital radius, that's all I want. And you can leave it here. What the orbital radius represents is distance from core to Earth to core of object, which you could use to figure out height above the ground. And again, my mistake caused both of these answers to be about two to three million bigger. So if you got about 13 million here and about 6.7 million here, you're correct. I made the mistake. There is, yes. I'm going to try to redraw this on the board. Or I can put force arrows all over it. So there is our flagpole hinge is right there on the far right side. And there are currently three forces acting on it. We have the weight of the sign, the weight of the physical flagpole, and also tension in the row, which has both a y component and an x component. Of those two Components only the Y component is able to create torque because that's the only component that is perpendicular to the length of the flagpole. So these two downward forces and this one upward pointing force are all going to generate torque. And since all of these are on the same side as the hinge, same side of the hinge, uh, the direction of the force is going to determine what direction that torque points. Uh, in my work, I added up the two clockwise torques 
that are caused by the, and so it's totally okay to take a writing implement and physically, you know, hold it as your teeter-totter or your flagpole and physically push on it to see what direction that, of torque that generates. If this is the flagpole and the weight of the sign points down on it, just push down on it, that would be clockwise. Same is true with the weight of the pole itself. So these two both generate clockwise torques. So part A, um, using the spot, how much torque do the sign and mass uh, generate? I added them together and called that net torque clockwise. The only counterclockwise torque present to negate them is the y caused by the Y component of tension. Because if you hold the pencil the same way and push up, it spins in the opposite direction. So these two are both generating clockwise torque, and the Y component of tension is the only thing generating counterclockwise torque to try to counteract that. Does that answer the question? So the sign's radius is one meter because the sign itself is physically hung at the end of the one meter long flagpole. So its weight is being applied right here. Whereas the pole itself, its mass is concentrated in its center of mass in the middle. That further radius away is generating more torque. I'm just going to try to think of a way to demonstrate that, but I don't have the things I want to use for that in the room right now. Oh, sorry, initially it's not supposed to be moving. So my intent here is CART 2's initial velocity is zero, and that's true for every part of this question. It's starting at rest. I'm sorry for, I, I thought, I had that thought when I was working in, uh, making this answer key. So the intent is it is stationary, and let me double check my wording on the test draft to make sure any relevant questions there specify. Yes, any relevant questions similar to this on the test specify stationary. Apologies. Talking about for part A? For part B. Oh. Um, in part B, part A slows down from 1.2 all the way to negative 0.72. So cart one actually turns around. And then cart two goes from zero to 0.48. 
So from rest to four words. <coughs> Bless you. Oh, that's my mistake. That's supposed to be Newton's. Sorry. Yeah, you're right. I calculated force and I wrote Pascal's for some reason. So that answer should be in Newton's. Sorry. The number should be fine. Just a unit. Thank you. Calling that out. I didn't notice. Same as the first test, and same structure. The first two questions on the first page are more concept-driven, short answer type things, and then the other nine are math-focused, but if you write in a paragraph summary, then you still get points. Still 105 points spread across all of the questions, and if you earn 100 of them, you get a 100. is slowing down or changing direction. You're talking about, um, there it is. Thank you. So, in this question, the impulse wound up being negative the way that I worked it. Uh, because in the question text, I state that the initial velocity is, um, no, it's, I suppose it doesn't actually say the word forwards. The implication here is really that the ball turns around. I just decided in my own work that the initial direction was positive and the, the reverse would then be negative. I'm realizing that I intended to write forwards and then backwards, and let me check my test wording. did specify forwards and backwards on any relevant test questions. So here the negative is just really meant to imply it turned around. If you just define the first direction as positive and the follow-up direction as negative, you get a negative answer because it turns around, which is key cornerstone of fixed ball, I think. So I didn't specify which direction was positive or negative, I would be looking for 
you to decide what sign the first direction has and then your answer having the opposite since it turns around. It's really, it just needs to match the direction of the force from the bat. Inertia, moment of inertia. Which you can ask on the test. I know that some letters get reused. I don't want that to be an issue. Uh, in the angular momentum formula, L equals I omega, that I is moment of inertia. You may label that on your formula sheet if you like. And that is separate from the I that is sometimes used for impulse. I like lowercase j for impulse, but not every textbook or formula she agrees with me. So, uh, this is a torque question. The idea is to compare the torque generated by the milk carton to the torque generated by the bicep muscle. Um, and I'm going to work it up through just to show you try to get the same answer. I 
Oh, okay, so lever arm, fulcrum. Oh no. So milk. Here's the mass of the milk. J. One point five grams. So the milk is going to generate torque based on the radius from the milk to the fulcrum in the elbow. Interestingly, the fulcrum is going to be 33 centimeters away as the elbow is the fulcrum, 25 centimeters is the distance from your palm to where the bicep muscle is acting, and then it's another eight centimeters to get to the fulcrum <coughs> of the elbow. So that radius for the sake of torque is actually 33 centimeters. Then, different color for the bicep. Who's mixing up the boxes? The bicep is going to pull up on the same side. So since they're different direction forces on the same side of the fulcrum, they'll generate opposite direction torques. There's a certain amount of force in the bicep, but that total force is applied at a 75 degree angle from the vertical. Only the Y component is able to generate any torque here because the radius it's acting on is in the X axis. So for the torque calculation, you only want to use the Y component and then you have to do a tiny bit of trick to determine the total amount of force in the bicep as a whole. And while I'm not a biologist, this is, and I haven't looked at that many drawings of muscles on skeletons, um, the muscles don't apply on the joints directly, they have to attach just past the joint to be able to do this, to be able to generate torque on the next bone over. Is that, again, I'm not a biologist, does that sound right? Some light nodding, good to see. So, the two torques here, to hold this thing up, lowering the weight of the forearm. To hold this thing up, net torque has to be zero. <laughs> the two torques present are the, again, the one caused by the vertical component of the bicep force. So eight centimeters, which is 0 0.08 meters, times the vertical component of the bicep force, plus 0.33 centimeters, distance from elbow to the milk carton, times the weight of the milk carton. So your mass of milk times negative 9.8, because the milk gravity does point down, noticeably in the opposite direction as the upward pointing force from the bicep muscle. So, 0 0.08 force bicep vertical should then be equal to oh, and all these have to add up to zero to hold the milk in place. So then bringing this big negative number over to the other side, 0 0.33, 1.61, 9.8, 5.207. That means that the vertical component of the bicep force would have to be 65.08 newtons. So that's the force that has to vertically be applied at this spot. And then, remember this works, tiny bit of trig to find force bicep. Total, 75 degrees, uh, 
cosine is adjacent over hypotenuse. So cos of 75 is 65.08 over FB. FB is 65.08 over cos of 75. And therefore, total force in the entire angle of the bicep would be approximately 251 and a half newtons. And this happens every time you move your arm. <coughs> to start with, did that help? Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, main things I'll point out just to everyone if you haven't tried this one yet. One, make sure you get your radii right because the elbow itself is actually the fulcrum. So that 25 centimeters it gives you from milk carton to bicep uh, interface point is actually kind of a kind of a trap. So you have to add that to the further eight centimeters to get the real distance from the weight to the joint in the elbow. Uh, you gotta set the torque from just the vertical component of the bicep force equal to the torque generated by the weight of the milk carton. And then, once you have that vertical piece, you gotta do a tiny bit of trig to find the entire bicep force. And, checking this in. In the interest of honesty, no actual trig made it onto the test. Now you should remember, as a practical rule, only forces perpendicular to radii generate torques. So just remember that for your day-to-day -day life. But for this specific test, you don't have to use any trig to find just the perpendicular component. Or, you know, use the perpendicular component to find the whole thing. homework or quiz questions you've been working on, now's a good time to ask too.
Tuesday, Wednesday, or Friday, as long as your schedule allows for it, you can take it during the lab. But only once, only at one try. I haven't had anyone try to take it twice. Yes? When you will be in your break time? Monday. Next week, we'll only see each other on Monday. There won't be any lab next week. It's Thanksgiving. Yeah, it's going to be Thanksgiving. So on Monday, lecture will just be get a test back. You'll have it before the break, and then you just don't have to think about it. And then we come back from break, we'll talk about waves and sound, and then the exam. Yes? Will the exam be like the tests? Yeah, it'll basically just be functionally the two tests sandwiched together about 18 questions, maybe less if I compressed a few concepts into similar questions. But if you feel comfortable with how I do tests, the exam will just be the same but longer and about everything. 210 points graded out of 200, still 105 out of 100. will on the exam still be the same basic pick the Newton's laws out of a lineup question. Sure. I'm going to rewrite them so you can't just find the same statements. So you have to read them for meaning, but as long as you can do that, that's at least one question out of the way. lecture that all this week will just be practice sessions. Uh, so whenever you feel comfortable, you can head on out of here. I'm just still going to be here answering questions until 12.30. That's when I take my lunch. So feel free to head on out whenever you feel comfortable. And make sure to let me know if you need anything, either by an email or in more lecture or review sessions this week. Remember, homework and quizzes are on the table. If you're just doing those, you can come in and ask about it. Have a good day.